How far are we going to get into this? New world order? World economic form, so-called great reset, antichrist, lead up before the rapture? I don't know. It could get way worse before we're out here. But I don't need to freak out. God is in control of all things. He can fix all things. Not just Old Testament times, New Testament times, but even today. He's a supernatural God. I just need to believe. I just need to pray. Oh, and have a great day. One more to seal the deal. God can supply all things. You might not just be in a predicament in these last days that God can fix. Don't need to freak out. Don't forget he's on the throne. No need to freak out when you turn on the news. And here's these guys up at it again. <laughs> but we might have some needs along the way too. Can God take care of that? <laughs> yeah. Last time I checked, creating the universe out of nothing. Piece of cake, right? And believe it or not, even Moses had to learn this. The great prophet of God, the man of God, all right? Uh, Moses, watch this. This blows, blows me away. Numbers 11, 18 through 23. Tell the people, God says to Moses, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. Now, the context here, they've been whining and complaining about God's provision, and even said that in the old days when they were in Egypt, they had it way better than this. Good thing we don't do that. <laughs> oh, by the way, the meat that God chose to use as an act of punishment was foul meat. <laughs> in case you didn't get that, let me bring out that important biblical truth. But watch this. How many, and you watch this. You get, I don't think God likes it when we act like he can't provide for us. Watch this. Then the Lord heard you when you wail. <laughs> if only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. They basically said what you saved us from was better than what you're doing now. Don't ever do that, Christian. Don't ever ask for what you deserve. Because myself included, we deserve to go to hell. You should be thankful for God's grace and mercy. <laughs> we were better off in Egypt. <laughs> really? All righty. Now the Lord will give you me. Yep. And this is just like a dad. Right? This is what dads do. I love this passage. Dads get this one. Oh, yeah, you're going to eat meat, pal. Right? <laughs> you're going to eat it. You're not going to eat it for just one day or two days or five or 10 or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. <laughs> How many guys ever complain about the third day into you eating spaghetti that your mom made in that big pot? And what was the response? Oh, yeah? You're going to get it for the rest of the week. Right? But anyway, so this is what God's doing here. This is cool. And you're going to come out of your mouth, right out of your nostrils. You're going to love that. Why? Because you rejected the Lord who is among you. You wailed before him saying, <laughs> but Moses said, listen, Moses got into it. This is what's crazy. Of all people, he should have known better. Moses, Listen. And he's speaking to God. Here I am, God, among 600,000 men on foot. And you say, I would give them meat to eat for a whole month. Here I am, God, it's a sunrise, a Christian. And, and what if they do this and they go to cancer society? And what if they I can't get grown to the morning? Excuse me. Would it be enough if the flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish of the sea were caught? Oh, what are they going to do? I don't know. How are they going to feed my family? It's the same thing today. The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Come on. You will now see, God says, whether or not what I say will come true for you. And it certainly did. God brought a big old foul storm of birds, thousands of them, and they got plenty of meat. But here's the point. Even Moses got caught up in the sin of doubting that God could provide, listen, not just period, but a huge need. Estimates are about 2 million people at this point. That's kind of a big need. And, but God can't take care of my family. <laughs> 2 million. Maybe you got a lot of kids, but I don't think it's 2 million. <laughs> they forgot who God is. He's in control of all things. He can fix all things. And guess what? He can supply all things. If he could throw the universe out, what else do you need? I think he could take care of my needs. 
And that's why God says, are you kidding me? Have you forgotten? It's not just how many people, how big it is. He can take care of it all. Let me give you another point. Israelites, they didn't learn the lesson. They kept having to get spankings from God. Good thing we don't get spankings from God. Have we forgotten who God is? Well, I love this one. 2 Kings 3, 17 to 18. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. And you and your cattle and your other animals will drink. This is what? An easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, and by the way, he'll also hand Moab over to you. Now, if you're not familiar with this passage, Elijah... He's basically encouraging the Israelites, would you stop freaking out? Crone translation, take a chill pill. And they were freaking out. Because again, thousands and thousands of them, they ran out of water. And then they had the Moabites on their tail. And he says, stop. How many times has God got to take care of you? And then all of a sudden today, with this circumstance, you think, oh, he can't take care of this one. And that's why he says, listen, you're going to see God supernaturally. And he did. Out of nowhere, filled the whole valley full of water. They got to drink. Their animals got to drink. And almost kind of like as a side note, like the stars. Oh, he made the stars also. Oh, hey, by the way, he's going to take care of my web for you. That's the context. God can supply all needs. What are you freaking out? And this is our problem, right? We go, well, God, you know, he did that thing back in the Old Testament, but... No, he did that for the early church, but for some reason we think he can't do it today? Are you kidding me? And you go, well, why, how can, why is it so easy for God? He's not just all powerful. The reason why he can supply any needs is because he owns everything. Psalm 24, read it and go to sleep. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. God, he, he needs grocery stores to meet. No, he doesn't. God's going to have to cut a deal with Wells Fargo if he's ever going to meet my finances. Are you kidding me? He owns everything. Right? Psalm 50. For every animal of the forest is mine, God says, even the what? The cattle on a thousand hills. Not the chickens. <laughs> when God wants to give an encouraging word, you know what it is. Cattle is right. But how many times do we do this in the last days? And folks, I mean, you're hearing the conversation. Right? <laughs> What if the rapture doesn't happen? These new world order guys, and, they, and, and, and they, they, we, we start experiencing genuine persecution. I get fired my job and be the Christian. Ah! No, no. What, what if they declare martial law and I limit travel? No, they, they launch these 15 minute cities. And I, I can't even get started. I'm living. I can't go. What if they shut down access to the Gaffey stars and go cash this out? What if Joe Biden gets elected? I had to throw that again again because that's a reality <laughs> we got to deal with. Ah! Yeah, you're right. Joe Biden destroying the economy is too powerful for God. He now cannot usurp Biden's authority. Get, that makes me want to brush my teeth saying that. <laughs> Read your Bible. God can control all things and is in control of all things. He can fix all things. He can supply all things. He made the universe out of nothing. He could supply any needs you got. It's chump change. Now, again, for proof context, these are all true stories from Christians serving the Lord, by the way, and watch how God provided. One time, this brand new Christian, they got saved. They're going to Bible college. <clears throat> After they paid all the bills, the tuition, they had $80 a month to live on. So that 80 bucks for the whole month was allocated for gas, clothing, entertainment, emergencies, and food. It all went to gas. They didn't have money for food, nothing. And I quote, they said they didn't have any money for food, but for three months... In a row, they never once had to go to the store. They never went hungry. And they said, quote, it's the strangest thing. I never asked for food. I had people out of the blue giving me food, inviting me over for supper, taking me out to eat. It was totally cool. In fact, I wish I would have kept on doing it. Quote, until I can get on my feet, God provided for me against all odds. It was like when God sent a raven to feed Elijah, making sure every day you had what you need. It's amazing. Another testimony. Another Christian in Bible college too, serving the Lord. Had a car whose driver's side window would never work right. If you rolled that thing down, it wasn't going back up. Now, let me explain what I just did there for you young whippersnappers. There was a day when windows, you couldn't just go... <laughs> you had to take this really low-tech device. It was called a handle. And you went like that. That's why, if you ever wonder, why did my mom and dad say roll up the windows? You don't roll up windows. Because we used to roll up windows and roll them down. We don't push buttons anymore. 
but you had to roll down. Anyway, so this window, you roll back down, and you had to, it, it would always go off track every single time. So consequently, never rolled it down, and even in the summer, so it was like a sweatmobile. They, so they share. Anyway, so one night, they're in Bible college, serving the Lord. It got stolen in Bible college, in the parking lot. For almost three weeks, they heard nothing from the police. The people said, it's totally gone, totally stripped. Write it off. 20 days later, they were told the news out of the blue. The car was found. And I quote, apparently the person who stole the car, guess what they did? It was summer. Rolled down that window. They couldn't get it back up. So it freaked them out. They ditched the car, left it outside of an apartment complex. It wasn't even touched. And when all was said and done, they, not a scratch was on the car. They ended up with a better stare and they gained $200. <laughs> Another testimony. This is a young Christian couple, a pastor and his wife. They just entered full-time ministry. And nothing uh, of chicanery or wrongdoing of their own. They just found themselves into a financial pitfall overnight. $4,000 in the hole. Financial pitfall. Now, for some folks, that may not sound like a big deal back then. For these folks, you might as well have said $4 million. So, believe it or not, lo and behold, out of the blue, God provided not only $4,000, but $5,000. And it wasn't a loan. It was a gift. And the person said, do not pay me back. And they weren't even a Christian. Amazing. Let me give you another one. Uh, another. This is another pastor and his wife. They had a 1996 Ford Taurus. Remember those things? Yes. Yeah. And uh, the pastor was all excited because it was the guy thing. It was like at 197,000 miles. Almost, you know, got it. 200,000. It's a guy thing. It's a goal in life. Well, it didn't make it because the transmission went out. It's done. Didn't have the money to get another vehicle. Really couldn't afford to choke down a car payment, but they needed another vehicle. Didn't tell anybody. Just prayed. Two days later, they get a phone call from a guy, and he says, hey, do you know anybody that needs a car? <laughs> sure do. Long story short, listen, they received for free a fully loaded, fully leather, heated seats, four-wheel drive mini SUV for free. Now, listen to that. That's not the other half. The guy then shares with them that... He was prompted two weeks prior to that from the Lord to give it away because he was going to go buy a new car and he's going to trade it in. But the Lord prompted him, no, don't do that. I want you to give it away. He resisted for two weeks. He didn't want to do it. He finally gave in, and that's when he sent the email for the car. And so think about that. If he would have obeyed two weeks and then contacted that Christian, the car, their car was fine at that point. But even the timing of the disobedience in God's provision. Isn't that amazing? Let me give you one more. Christian couple, serving the Lord, pastor and his family, they were financially strapped. They had no insurance, not even dental insurance, but kids, they sure like eating those sweet things. So they had to go to the dentist and they had a bill for $164. Couldn't pay. Had no money, completely tapped out. So I said, God, you know the need. We're not being extravagant. We're not being foolish. It's just it happens. And we ain't got no money. So they go to the mail. They pray. They go later that afternoon. They go check the mail. In the mail was a Christmas card from three months prior because this was about March. And all of a sudden in March, a Christmas card shows up. Right? Turns out the people who sent the card, who, by the way, never before or after sent one, not only sent a card, but they sent something that they'd never done before, and it was a check. Inside this card. And the check was for a really weird amount. Can anybody guess what it was? 164 bucks. The day. And the reason why they got it late is because they sent it to their old address and it was floating around the mail system until that day when they needed it. Now, if you haven't guessed it, all those stories are me, my wife, and kids. Every one of them. And I stand before you, not just quoting scripture. We've lived this over and over again. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. He is in control of all things. He can fix anything. I don't care what your need is, man. He can do it even supernaturally. In fact, that's why he says, you just seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and then you could live like this. Can you imagine? You got divine permission from God to live like this. So do not what? Worry. Who shall we eat? I'm Bill Gates and the, the fake meat. Milk. What shall we drink? Oh, we're not taking us all. And what shall we wear? Oh, no. Class mommy's coming again. 
That's what pagans do, not Christians. The pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need him. He's going to take care of you. And again, he will do it just like he did with the universe, even if he has to make it out of nothing. How many times do we read these accounts and we don't realize the full story of what's going on here? It's not just supplying the need. It's supplying it out of nothing. Matthew 14, 15 to 21, as evening approached, the disciples came to him, Jesus, and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And what was their response? <gasps> we, ain't gonna know. we only got five loaves of bread and two fish. Right? Bring them here to me, Jesus said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves of the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, and he broke the loaves. He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to people. Listen, they ate and satisfied, and the disciples, what? This is just like God. He gives you more than even what you were asking for. And they ate and were satisfied, and the disciples, they picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and children, so you're looking at probably 10,000 plus people. How many times do we read this and we're going like, wow, that's pretty cool. God fed a bunch of people. It isn't just he fed a bunch of people. He what? He made it out of nothing. Well, that's strange. No, it's not. He made the universe out of nothing. He can't make bread out of thin air. Fish. Listen, he can't supply for us even in these last days. Are you kidding me? He doesn't need a bank. He doesn't need a grocery store. And this is our problem. We act like God only did those things back then. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he wants to bring something out of thin air, he'll do it. One more story, true story. Young Christian mom, single mom, said it was the summer of 2002. And man, it was a bittersweet time for me, my three kids, and I. We just moved and needs to say we were struggling financially. We had nothing. And one afternoon after picking up my two youngest kids up from school, my seven-year-old son asked if we could have pizza for supper. And my heart broke when I replied, son, we can't, we can't afford pizza. But my nine-year-old daughter spoke up and told my son if he really wanted pizza, he should just pray for it because God could afford it. <laughs> so my son proceeded to lift up his little request to God with all the faith the child has. And listen to what she said. And for a split second, I envied his childlike faith as a Christian adult. And I wondered at what point in my life I had lost the ability as a Christian adult to just simply believe. Also, during the course of his prayer, my son remembered we were also out of toilet paper. So he prayed, God, could you also get us some toilet paper? <laughs> she said, I was a little embarrassed that he would ask the creator of the universe for that, but I, I, I let him pray. Well, the rest of the afternoon, she said, was uneventful, but about 445... The doorbell rang, and my two youngest children went to look through the window to see who it was, and fully expecting them to tell me it was one of their friends, I was not prepared for what came next. My son yells out, Mom, Mom, the pizza dude's here! The pizza dude's here! What? She said, I made my way to the front door in a state of confusion. My son, he's running through the house. It's an angel! It's an angel! God sent an angel to bring us pizza! She goes, so I go to the door to clear up the confusion because I was sure that this pizza dude was at the wrong house, and I was also worried about the disappointment my son was going to feel when he learned that the pizza delivery boy was at the wrong house. And so I replied, she says to the delivery boy, she says, says she said that, hey, listen, we, we, we didn't order this pizza. And I quote, the pizza boy says, uh, I know, ma'am. Someone called the order in and paid for it with a credit card, and we were asked to deliver it to you around 5 p.m. How would you like that credit card? <laughs> and she said, listen, I must have been, this is what God does. He doesn't just supply it's leftovers, abundant. She said, I must have been quite a sight standing there with my two daughters, our mouths hanging open in total disbelief, and my son standing behind us saying, see, I told you God sends angels to deliver pizza. <laughs> and so the delivery boy handed me four large pizzas. Isn't that just like God? And I carried our feast into the kitchen, still in shock. And I was standing there trying to absorb just what had happened. And just as I was wondering these things, watch this, my son yells from the garage, Mom, Mom, I, I was looking through this box in the garage, and guess what I found? Four rolls of Charmin toilet paper. <laughs> the good stuff, not the itchy, scratchy, cheap stuff. 
She goes, well, apparently I packed that toilet paper in a box some three years ago from some previous moves, and he just happens to find it then? She says, so I broke down and I cried, thanking God for the miracles he showered over us that day. Listen, this, that summer was one of the hardest, but one of the best of my life. Why? Because I simply learned as a Christian to simply believe in God again, no matter what it looks like. Why? Because God is good. And yes, he does send angels to deliver pizza. <laughs> Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. All we need to do, Christian, these last days, how far are we going to be into this? I don't know. But all we got to do is listen to his voice right here. Here's his voice. I want to hear it out loud. Read the Bible out loud. This is his voice. You listen to his voice. You believe. You trust him. You pray. And he'll guide his home like he did for this pastor. Watch this. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. My pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up and it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're gonna. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently and we start climbing and it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looked at me and his eyes rolled back in his head. And he starts mumbling and he passes out, passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you gotta wake up so I can kill you. Now we were in the cloud <laughs> flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we gonna do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it. I said, Tell we don't know nothing. Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell him that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm gonna get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on and said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we gotta do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you gotta promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. 
And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die, but I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're gonna make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices? And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop, and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning. The knock at my door. I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. Even the last days. How far are we going to be into this before the rapture? I don't know. But what I do know is God is on the throne. He's always on the throne. He's never not on the throne. And so whether it's Old Testament times, whether it's New Testament times, whether it's today, you and I in the last days, we just need to listen to his voice. Stay with his voice. Let his voice Put this into your head. He's in control of all things. 
He can fix all things. And He can supply whatever needs we come across. And He will land us safely home. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.